From the KPFK studios in Southern California, it's the Ralph Nader Radio Hour. Stand up, stand up, you've been sitting way too long. Welcome to the Ralph Nader Radio Hour. I'm Steve Scrovan, along with David Feldman and, of course, the man of the hour, Ralph Nader. Today, we're going to present another chapter in our ongoing discussion about food. I think somebody on this crew is very hungry. And we're also going to be critiquing the mainstream corporate media. That will be in the second half of the show when we'll be talking to Jim Narikas, who is the editor of Extra, which is the newsletter put out by the group FAIR, which stands for Fairness and Accuracy in Reporting. And as always, we will be checking in to see what the bad guys are up to this week with Russell Mokhyber, our corporate crime reporter. And if we have some time left, we will get to more of your listener questions. David? Our first guest is Forrest Pritchard. He joins us from Georgia. Mr. Pritchard is a seventh generation farmer and New York Times bestselling author. He has devoted his family farm, Smith Meadows, to farming organically and sustainably and raising free range cattle, pigs, goats, sheep and chickens. His book, Gaining Ground, A Story of Farmers Markets, Local Food, and Saving the Family Farm, made the New York Times bestseller list and was named Top Read by Publishers Weekly, The Washington Post, and NPR's The Splendid Table. Mr. Pritchard's new book is called Growing Tomorrow, Behind the Scenes with 18 Extraordinary Sustainable Farmers Who Are Changing the Way We Eat. We want to thank him for taking some time out from his book tour to speak with us. Welcome to the Ralph Nader Radio Hour, Forrest Pritchard. Uh, the pleasure is all mine. Happy to be talking with you guys. Yes, indeed. Welcome, Forrest Pritchard. I'm looking at this remarkable book of yours, which is like no other one that I've seen. You went around the country interviewing 18 extraordinary sustainable farmers and solicited some of their best recipes, and you had little nuggets of wisdom from these farmers I find it really delightful you went to work to do that. Now, on a larger scale, I think what your intent was uh, not just to show a few farmers, but to encourage consumers to recognize this could be a real economic movement, which I have called displacement. That is, the more farmer to consumer markets there are, the more billions of dollars are spent in that manner the fewer billions of dollars are going to be spent for giant agribusiness, supermarket chains, and the food processors who take the life out of the food and put some unsavory additives in Mm -hmm. it at the same time. So I'm looking at this book as a precursor of really getting people to realize that when they spend their dollars at these farmer markets, direct farmer to consumer markets, and there are over 8,000 of them in the country and they're growing, that they're part of a real powerful community economic movement that weakens the big guys and preserves the small farmers. So tell us, Forrest Pritchard, about what inspired you to do this book after your best-selling Gaining Ground when you took over a money-losing farm that your grandparents and others in your family background had and turned it into a robust economic enterprise. Right. Well, I think just like you alluded to, the hope of the customer connection and and understanding the collaborative value of a dollar that you know a dollar isn't just a dead end into a sandwich or a car or, or a mortgage payment that we can do so much more and extend our dollars you know to really vote our values with our dollars. I kind of did that artistically with gaining ground. And I put that story out there. It was a hopeful story of our individual farm, but I also knew it was an American story of all the farms in the 70s and the 80s and 90s were, you know, in excess of 100,000 American farms for one reason or another were forced to sell. And that reason usually stemmed back to commodity fluctuations, high mortgage rates, young farmers choosing not to farm. Whatever the reason, it all kind of coalesced. And I kind of put that message in a bottle, like anybody has to, whatever your message is, you send it out to the world and the world either receives it or it doesn't. And it was one of those experiences where, you know, a hundred thousand bottles washed back against the shore with empathy, with compassion, with desire to participate. You know, and most of these people weren't farmers. Uh, These were people from cities and suburbs and small towns far and wide who weren't family farmers who probably had been in their families, but they said, yes, you know, we want to help. We want to collaborate. We want to, you know, rebuild our communities. 
And what is more sensible place than to do that around food? So that's really where the, the spirit of growing tomorrow comes in is to say, look, this isn't just one farm. It's not one economy. It's not one little niche. It's from the Puget Sound down to Georgia and Cape Cod to Santa Fe. And it's urban beekeepers in Dallas, Texas, and, and urban gardeners in Detroit, Michigan. And it's people that are doing, not just talking, but they're doing. Right. And it's a beautiful book. You go through 18 of these farms, for example, the Potomac Vegetable Farms, and you have three recipes, garlic, yogurt, tomato bites, pear, cucumber, and sesame slaw, and prosciutto-wrapped cantaloupe with balsamic glaze. And then you go into, you know, what they think about their farm. And you have little sidebars that say, did you know less than 2% of the population is directly responsible for growing America's food, while an additional 15% processes, distributes, and sells the farmer's produce? And I might add, the farmer doesn't get much of that dollar by the time. Yeah, about 11 cents or so. Yeah, 11 cents and sometimes even less for a tomato. And that's why Forrest Pritchard, with whom we're talking, wants to emphasize that he's talking about direct farm to consumer without a middle, a series of middle men, as they're called, or processors. And the second farm was the Nicholas Farm and Orchard Mm -hmm. and three nice recipes there, fresh linguine, with spring radishes and peas, homemade pasta, and lavender and lemon balm mint tea. Right. How did you pick these farms? And they're really all over the country. There's a map, a color map in the book that shows where they're from. Right. Yeah, it was kind of a Venn diagram of sorts. I'm a farmer's market farmer myself. That's how we market our own produce. And I started looking around. I said, this is my local farmer's market. What would a farmer's market dream team kind of look like if we could have a national farmer's market, you know? So I kind of took a couple, you know, overlapping circles and of geography, of ethnicity, of ages, of multi-generationality, and and especially of different types of fruits, vegetables, meats, seafood, honey, you name it. It's practically in the book, grains. And where those diagrams overlapped was where I looked. And this country is so ability to grow such healthy, nutritious food. It's such a robust ability that, frankly, it wasn't that hard to find these farmers. They're out there from coast to coast. Are you an advocate for the notion that really nutritious food is delicious? Because, you know, in today's schools, they're trying to get the children to eat more nutritious food, fruits and vegetables, and the children just shove it aside. They've had their tongues cultivated since infancy to crave fat, sugar, salt products. And how do you overcome that? I mean, I was raised on very nutritious food. And my mother always said, if you really want delicious food that leaves a great taste in your mouth after you swallow it, make sure it's nutritious. But food processing today is just the opposite. What do you think? Well, I mean, that has to start at home. I mean, a a kid isn't going to go to the grocery store and shop for themselves, or it has to start with leadership within our school programs. One or the other has to start with parenting or whoever the role model is whether it's in schools or homes. And I always tell people, you know, don't worry about, you know, whether it's uh, expensive or sustainable or any of this stuff. I said, just the the problem is, is just take it home and compare it to the packaged food. Take some fresh food home from farmer's market and tell me with a straight face that it doesn't taste better, you know, and tell me that's not a value. You know, anybody that's grown their own food, they understand that value. Anybody that's shopped at farmer's market understands that the greatest value of all is that it tastes wonderful at the end of the day. So, You know, Peter Behuth, who used to run Greenpeace, once wrote a memorable uh-huh. article on the journey of a tomato raised in Mexico, and it finally gets to New England in a store. And after you read that article, you never want to buy a tomato that hasn't been produced more than 30 miles from where you live. Give our listeners a sense of what happens, especially in the winter, when produce is heavily imported from Mexico. What happens while it's being produced, how it's treated, how it's being shipped, and how can it possibly be economic if it's shipped 3,000 miles away? Give us a tour of a Mexican tomato. Sure, sure. Well, I mean, for example, you know, we think about the American farmer and you know, we get up in an airplane and we look down at 38,000 feet, everything looks all hunky-dory. But the fact is 50% of the crops that are grown in this country are corn and soybeans, not destined for human food, but destined for feed and fuel. We back that number out a little bit. 85% 
of our food is grown domestically, but 15% is being imported. That is bumping up against 30 to 50% of our fruits and vegetables, right? So that kind of gives you some overarching perspective about how much of this food is actually being grown by our American farmers. And so we take that food and the carbon, the carbon footprint is catastrophic. I mean, from the greenhouse, the propane that needs to be uh, fueled to uh, heat these greenhouses, the amount of pesticides and herbicides, and then the 1,500 to 200, 2,500 miles it takes for that food to get to your plate, the trucking, the warehousing. I mean, the economics of it to get a slice of tomato from Mexico to your subway sandwich shop in Chicago or uh, McDonald's, no, oh, McDonald's probably didn't use tomatoes too much, but is is devastating. And the farmer, as, as we alluded to earlier, in America is only going to be getting about 11 cents of that. A farmer in Mexico is going to be getting an even smaller fraction of that. It's a system based on exploitation from beginning to end. Right. And the closer it gets to you, the consumer, the bigger the profits, like in your Safeway or Giant Foods or your supermarkets. It's the food processors that make most of the money. Isn't that right? Yeah. It's about 30 cents on any dollar. So we spend a dollar on food. Let's break that dollar down. About 30 cents goes to processing. Another 25 cents goes to the retailer. About a nickel goes to packaging. Another nickel goes to marketing. Another 18 cents goes to distribution. Another 15 cents goes into trucking. And then when we get down to the people that actually produce this food, we're left with about a a glorified dime. (laughs) You know, it makes you wonder uh, how we kind of prioritize value in our food system. Well, we're talking with Forrest Pritchard, the author of the new book, which just came out on October 20th, by the way, called Growing Tomorrow by the Experiment Press in New York City. It's really beautifully done in color. And the subtitle is Behind the Scenes with 18 Extraordinary Sustainable Farmers Who Are Changing the Way We Eat. Farms like the Garcia Organic Farms, the Riverview Farms, Red Lake Nation Foods, Kiyokawa Family Orchards, Texas Honeybee Guild, Nick Muto, and Backside Bakes. Let me ask David and Steve, do any of you like hot food? Yes, of course. Okay, let me put this challenge down. On page 120 of Forrest's book, he has a did you know. Did you know the world's hottest chili pepper is called the Carolina Reaper? a golf ball-sized dynamo 400 times hotter than a jalapeno. 400 times. Are you game, (laughs) David, Steve? It sounds more like a weapon than a food. (laughs) (laughs) And what's the antidote, Forrest? Casein uh, combats capsaicin. That's a tongue twister, trying to say that three times fast. But a casein, of course, is a natural component of milk. The trick to do is eat some yogurt or, or dairy which, of course, with Indian food has been happening for thousands of years. Uh, They balance those spicy curries with some yogurt. And this is just a taste of what's in this book. And the various recipes are in conjunction with color pictures. Tell us about wild rice pancakes with apple topping from the Red Lake Nation Foods. Incredible story. It's just fascinating. And this book is American history. The living American history. So Red Lake Nation is a, uh, a Native American tribe. It's a it's sovereign territory within the state of Minnesota, about three hours north of Minneapolis. And they own acreage that roughly adds up to the size of Rhode Island, if you can imagine. So what they do from a cultural standpoint is for, you know, for eons, have cultivated wild rice. And what they used to do is go out in birch bark canoes and wait for this rice. And this, again, is is wild rice. So this is a grain as opposed to a fruit, which is our white rice, which is the more common rice. So they'd go out in birch bark canoes and use sticks, and they'd kind of tap the sticks, and the the rice would fall into the canoes. Well, it's 2015. They're not harvesting it on big scale in canoes anymore. They've got these modified combines. But these farms are just enormous rice paddies out in the middle of Minnesota growing, you know, hundreds and hundreds of tons of wild rice every year and shipping it all across the country. I was with a public gathering the other day with Winona LaDuke, who you may know. Uh She comes from a reservation in northern Minnesota, and she gave me some packages of wild rice. And in your book, describing the Red Lake Nation foods, on page 209, you say, quote, Minnesota is a Lakota phrase combining mini, which is the word for water, with sota, which is sky-tinted. That's why I always like to say Minnesota. 
not Minnesota. Right, right. In a land of 10,000 lakes, you write, rice is nature's link between water and heavens, earthly abundance reaching skyward in the wooded, eddying backwaters. The wind moves, and I imagine the sound of rice falling against birch bark clicks like raindrops on a hot summer day, end quote. And in reading this for us, I imagine millions of young children who are looking at their smartphone and playing video games or text messaging to themselves, never going outdoors, never even playing outdoors much anymore, never looking at the horizon, at the moon, Mm -hmm. at the stars, at the sun. What do you say to young people when you talk to them about what they're missing in the ruptured connection with nature? Right. I think nobody, not yourself or anyone, likes to be told that they're doing it wrong. So you have to promote what's desirable in life. And to be starting out, for example, as a young farmer in 2015, there's been no more optimistic or hopeful time to reconnect with nature. The consumer base is passionate. It's driven. The average age of the American farmer is 58.5. And there's been no greater diversity of opportunity between farmer's markets, farm-to-table restaurants. CSAs, you know, retailers like Whole Foods. So for those young people that want to put down their iPhones, and they will, you know, and for the people that want to log out of Facebook, and they will, and they are, and they want to find an alternative, uh, the alternatives have just have never been finer, in my opinion. And, you know, if they would only give themselves this experience, of course, for urban children, that's more difficult than for suburban or exurban or rural children. Sure. They really have more fun. They have more fun running right. through the woods, chasing their dreams and listening to the birds and figuring out which birds are associated with which songs. And sure. I mean, it's just so much more delightful, but they never seem to get the opportunity unless they can go, you know, like from New York City, there's a program that, yeah. that brings these kids to farms in New England for four weeks or so. And there have been reports where these kids, it's the first time they've ever put their feet on dirt, on soil. First time right, ever. Amazing. And amazing. they just jump with joy and jump into the lake or into the streams. That's the tragedy of sure. it. If they only knew what they yeah. were missing. Yeah, I think you're referring to the fresh air kids. Yeah. Uh, is, is what that program is called. And what a concept that we even have to call it fresh air. <laughs> you know? I know. So we have to export kids out of the city for four weeks to get some fresh air, but. Yeah, just another place where, you know, we can vote with our dollars. And it's, it's so transparent, you know, the, the deep, lasting value of what we can accomplish like this. So. You know, you have on page 71, you have Nicola. It's the Ozark Forest Mushrooms, Salem, yeah. Missouri. And you have a little sidebar. It says, Nicola's Rural Wisdom. This is worth yeah. li- listening to. Quote, I think a lot of people are afraid to ever be by themselves, completely away from other people. But being alone every once in a while is important. It helps you remember to like yourself, end quote. A lot of wisdom in that. When she told me that, I was just struck by that. For a society where we're so interminably connected, we're you know, updating this and checking that and pinging and binging and, and answering the phone. Here's a lady who's out in the middle of rural Missouri, 40 minutes from near a cell signal, okay, and has found the satisfaction to honor herself, honor her environment by just being quiet, by being contemplative. And look, at it, she describes in your book, I'm quoting her now, quote, We've got so many hummingbirds here, and owls, and whip-poor-wills. Have you ever seen a whip-poor-will? Her eyes light up at the mention. Strange little birds only come out at night. The head of an owl, the body of a pigeon, and what a voice. End quote. <laughs> How do people get this book, yeah. Forrest? How do they get this book, uh, apart from the bookstore? Sure, well, of course, yeah. Well, fortunately, it is in, uh, in bookstores nationwide from uh, Barnes and & Noble and, and Books a Million, the real biggies, uh, down to your local bookstores. And my goodness, if we don't support local bookstores, then, uh, then who's going to do that? So short of that, and of course, it's on Amazon, which is an afterthought. But yeah, if no other option, do that. And then we've got a website, growingtomorrowbook.com, where you can get autographed copies if that's what you'd like. And how do they get in touch with you? Yeah, real easy. Uh, ForrestPritchard.com. Try to make it as easy as possible. That's ForrestPritchard.com. Tell our listeners, many of whom may be from cities, are small farmers growing? 
Are there more small farms? Are they closer to markets? What's the trend here? Yeah, the trend is all positive. Like any census, you can tease out facts on one end and then facts on the other and competing facts. And that's the nature of censuses. And we got to, you know, it takes about five years sometimes to, to sort all that information out. But a couple of trends are pretty concrete. The number of farms has been going down for a while, but been leveling off very strongly. The number of small farms, small acreages has been slightly on the increase. A lot of those are finding a great deal of traction in what's being dubbed as a, as a green belt, which is green kind of beltway around urban areas, which is, you know, has always been a very sensible agricultural urban relationship where farmers uh, protect the outskirts of the land and, and cultivate and, and nourish the people inside the city and exchange them for services. You know, that's primarily where a, a great deal of traction is going on. Give us an idea of the acreage. Like, how large is your farm? How large are some of these 18 farms? And when you say small yeah, yeah. farm, what are you talking about? Well, I was very intentional, again, going back to that Venn diagram idea of kind of overlapping. A diversity of scale, I think, is incredibly important because in our culture, we value things like houses and shopping malls over farmland. And that's emblematic, whether you're in Lincoln, Nebraska, or uh, New York City. So in this book, I have two farmers who don't own any land at all, two producers, I should say. One is urban beekeepers in Dallas, and one is a sustainable fisherman, Nick Muto, off of Cape Cod. So we can grow food without actually owning any land. I've got a farm in downtown Detroit, Michigan, that operates on seven acres, and for the price of a $1 a year lease with the city of Detroit. And that goes all the way up to the size of my farm, for example, which is 500 acres, and bigger than that. So the point is, I mean, economics, land access, these are getting to be arguments that we don't have to be having. What we need to be having is not arguments. We just need to be doing, seeking opportunities, because the opportunities are there. A couple quick questions. What are the ag schools, the university yes. ag schools, what are they doing in terms of this movement? Are they encouraging it? Well, I mean, make no mistake, our traditional ag schools have been sponsored and, you know, research has been sponsored by large industrial food and manufacturers and stuff like that. So uh, anytime you do that, there's there's also a place in D.C. called K Street uh, for lobbyists, you know, so that's going to influence policy. But the rise of sustainable agricultural programs just in the last five years is noteworthy. Places like University of Missouri, University of California, University of Davis have been very proactive. So some of these major land-grant universities that used to be devoted solely to how can we grow more corn, how can we put you know, more efficient tractors in the field, are now looking at permaculture, organic, sustainable systems as a true viable component of our uh, food landscape. And your farms, the farms you chose in this book, Growing Tomorrow, are they near minimal use of herbicides, fungicides, pesticides, nitrogen fertilizers? Where are they? How close are they to organic? Yeah, yeah. So organic wasn't a, a requisite to be in this book. It's a book about sustainable farmers. And to nutshell it, I describe sustainability as a three-legged stool. You take away any leg and the stool falls over. Okay, an easy way to remember it is it's, it's three E's. It's economics, it's environment, and it's energy. And what that means is we all understand the relationship with herbicides and, and fossil fuels to the environment. And so all these farmers have a strong bent against or away from using commercial fertilizers, chemicals, fossil fuel, tractors, things of that nature. But it didn't have to be exclusive to that. The second is the economics. These farms actually had to be generating a profit from what they're doing. So it's, it's all nice to talk about, you know, sunshine and rainbows and butterflies, and everybody likes that until you've got to pay your bills, right? So these farms are actually generating a profit. And third was that human energy component, because farming is so enterprise and experiential intensive that it's incredibly easy to burn out. You know, it's incredibly easy to overextend ourselves. So the farmers had to be operating within their own personal energy levels. Or else, really, what's the point of putting a book out there like this just to encourage people to sign up for something that's not going to work for them? So that was kind of the three uh, energy, environment, and, and, and economy that played into that sustainability choice. And then when you're selling, you'd like to sell direct to the consumer. But do some of yeah. these farms sell to co-ops? Like there are a lot of food mm -hmm. co-ops in Minnesota, St. Paul area, and to CSAs. So you've got three outlets, mm -hmm. the direct consumer, the CSAs where families sign up for mm -hmm. a summer's worth of produce, and co-ops. Can you give us your views mm -hmm. on all that? 
Yeah, yeah, and there's uh, if we want to include farm to table restaurants in there, and, and maybe you know agritourism, those might also be components to that. You know, in 1996, when I graduated from college and started kind of rebooting our conventional farm and taking it to, towards direct marketing, uh, farmers markets was kind of that ancient cultural intersection, you know, extending way back into time where people got it. You know, you go to farmer's market, you buy food. And some of these other options, co-ops, CSAs, big natural organic chains like Whole Foods, et cetera, uh, even Chipotle to a certain degree, weren't an option, right? So farmer's markets were the sensible place for me to go because I was going to save my farm. You know, I was going to do it one way or the other. I was going to make it happen. But now starting out, the landscape is so much more diverse. Customer demand and the customer education is so much greater that farmers really do have these diversified options to sell their products at the place that makes the most sense for them. Well, back in the 1960s, Forrest, we were fighting for clean, safe food, nutritious food. It was like voices in the wilderness. And then the Center for Science and the Public Interest started an offshoot of one of our groups under Dr. Michael. Jacobson and put out this very widely circulated newsletter, which I hope you get called Nutrition Action. And whenever we put out these books, we'd get on the Phil Donahue show and even Mike Douglas show and Merv Griffin show, mass audiences. It's a really a shame that those shows are not current today to put you on and reach a huge audience. And I'm talking about selling 100, 200,000 books with one show. But sure, sure. this is a great gift for the holidays, listeners. It's called Growing Tomorrow with Recipes, Wisdom, and the kind of horizon that gets you say, you know, when I participate in this farmer to consumer marketplace, I'm building a new economy. I'm building a sub-economy that's displacing the giant agribusiness economies who treat food like digits on their accounting platform and take the nutrition out of it and put coloring additives and preservatives into it and then misleadingly market it. So it doesn't even taste good. That's why they have to use so much sugar, <laughs> salt, and fat. So thank you very much, Forrest Pritchard. Good luck on your book. And one more time, your website where they can reach you. Yeah, really easy, ForrestPritchard.com. And the book is available nationwide and support your local bookstore. And your farm is where in Virginia? Yeah, we're, in, we're on the Virginia, West Virginia line. It's called Smith Meadows, and that's just smithmeadows.com. Good. If you're anywhere near there, listeners, drop by. You'll take visitors. You even have a bed and breakfast that your mom is running, right? Just tell them Ralph Nader sent you, and we'll take care of them. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Thanks very much, Forrest. My pleasure. Take care. Yeah. Bye-bye now. We've been talking to organic farmer and author Forrest Pritchard. His latest book is Growing Tomorrow, Behind the Scenes with 18 Extraordinary Sustainable Farmers Who Are Changing the Way We Eat. Go to growingtomorrowbook.com to pick up a copy and go to forrestpritchard.com to find out more about his farming philosophy. Before we leave this topic, David, I want to say when I was doing all the interviews for the documentary An Unreasonable Man about Ralph, a lot of the people, and I, you know, I've never said this to Ralph, would say, man, that guy could eat when they were talking about Ralph. And when Ralph, when you were running down some of those recipes, I could sense that your mouth was watering. <laughs> well, I've always, from my upbringing, equated nutrition with delicious food. So when people ask me, what do you think of this dinner? I, I don't just say it's delicious. I say it's nutritious. Uh, once you combine the two, you make much better choices in terms of food for yourself and your family. Very good. I'm wondering if instead of people using Visa or MasterCard, there's a piece of plastic called Ralph Nader sent me, and it's used in the sharing economy. <laughs> <laughs> Right. I, I mean, if somebody said Ralph Nader sent me, I go, oh, come on in, have some, have a meal here. You want these books? I'm, I was going to donate these here, but take these books. <laughs> Actually, you know, his mother, Forrest Pritchard's mother, always dreamed of having a bed and breakfast, but they never had the money and she had to have a full time job elsewhere. The farm wasn't producing much money, it was losing money. And just think of this. This farm now has come back big time, and they built a bed and breakfast right on the farm, and her dream has been realized. That's a great story. Hi, everybody. Steve Scrovan here. This is a special announcement for our podcast audience only, especially those of you who live in Southern California. I know we have a lot of Southern California listeners. I want to invite you to a stand-up comedy show that I am organizing to benefit the work of public citizen. It's called Stand Up for Main Street. 
It's going to be on Sunday, November 1st at the WGA Theater in Beverly Hills at 6.30 p.m. Now, this is the fifth year in a row I've put this on. It's always a fantastic evening of laughter and inspiration. In the past, we've had tremendous comedians like Bill Burr and Greg Fitzsimmons and Mark Merritt and Ray Romano and Kevin Nealon, Dimitri Martin, Paula Poundstone, Jeff Garland, Dom Herrera, Dana Gould. And we've got another great show lined up for you this year. This year, we are featuring Gerard Carmichael of NBC's The Carmichael Show. We've got Brent Morin from the NBC show Undateable. We have Kira Saltanovich, who you may know from The Tonight Show. She does uh, my friend David Feldman's podcast all the time. We have Jimmy O. Yang from Silicon Valley. Beth Stelling, who's appeared in Conan and Jimmy Kimmel Live. And my good friend Angelo Tsaroukas from Last Comic Standing. And the incomparable political satirist who is coming down special from San Francisco, Will Durst. And it's hosted by me. And that's Sunday, November 1st at the WGA Theater, 135 South Doheny in Beverly Hills, 6.30 showtime. Go to citizen.org, click on the Stand Up for Main Street button that will take you to the page where you can buy tickets. And even if you're not in the L.A. area, you can help us out by going to Facebook, searching for Stand Up for Main Street 5, and sharing the post with your friends. So that's Sunday, November 1st, 6.30 p.m., WGA Theater for Stand Up for Main Street 5. Go to citizen.org for tickets. Now back to the show. You are listening to the Ralph Nader Radio Hour. Let's check in with the corporate crime reporter, Russell Mokhyber. From the National Press Building in Washington, D.C., this is your corporate crime reporter morning minute for Thursday, October 22, 2015. I'm Russell Mokhyber. United Parcel Service will pay $4.2 million to resolve allegations that it routinely falsified delivery records regarding state and city government packages for years. Earlier this year, UPS settled similar allegations with the federal government for $25 million. The case was brought by a former UPS employee, Robert Folk, under the Federal False Claims Act and the False Claims Act of 19 states. The lawsuit alleges the UPS fraudulently obtained payment for delivery service not actually performed. For example, UPS allegedly entered false delivery times into its tracking system to make it appear that packages were delivered on time to government customers when, in fact, they were not. For the Corporate Crime Reporter, I'm Russell Mokhyber. Thank you, Russell. If you've missed any of this episode on the radio, remember you can go to ralphnaderradiohour.com and catch up with our conversation with Forrest Pritchard or any of the other informative conversations we've had on our previous 83 episodes. We provide links to guests and their work. You can submit questions. And we have also added a new feature, a downloadable PDF transcript of the show, starting with the episode from three weeks ago we did with software expert Eben Moglin and Paul Hudson of Flyers Rights. You'll see the link posted just above the audio player on your computer. You may have to give us a couple of days to get the transcript up there, but it'll be up there, and that's another way to be in touch with what we're doing here on the Ralph Nader Radio Hour. Steve? Thanks, David. Jim Narikas is the editor of Extra, which is the monthly newsletter of media criticism put together by the group FAIR, which stands for Fairness and Accuracy in Reporting. He's the co-author of The Way Things Aren't, Rush Limbaugh's Reign of Error. He has worked as an investigative reporter for the newspaper In These Times, where he covered the Iran-Contra scandal. Personally, I received the online FAIR blog weekly in my inbox, and it's one of the things in my inbox I actually enjoy opening. It's succinct, incisive, witty, and kind of like The Daily Show as a way of peeling away the hypocrisy of how the corporate media treats news stories. So it's my pleasure to welcome you to the show, Jim Narikas. Thanks for having me on. Thanks for coming on, Jim. I want to start by saying something about Extra. Extra basically puts the eagle eye on the foibles of the press and how they slant or not cover or distort the news. And they also have a weekly radio program, which I think is marvelously done, and try to listen to it every chance I get. Before we get into several of your recent critiques in your newsletter, Jim, Describe the program and how people can tune into it. Well, it's aired on 150 stations across the country and Canada, but you can also hear it online at fair.org. It's called Counterspin, and look there, and, and there'll be, be links to hear the show. We are also beginning to transcribe the show, so you can read back episodes of it if you prefer. 
Yes. Well, let's start with three of your recent commentaries. One is called Washington Post Reduces Palestinian Victims to a Word Problem. The second is the New York Times on the Trans-Pacific Partnership, too secret for critics to have a right to complain about. And the third is the New York Times continues to obscure responsibility in the United States bombing of the hospital that was run by Doctors Without Borders in Kunzu, Afghanistan, with the horrible loss of life. Let's start with the Palestinian-Israeli situation. There are many, many people in Israel and Palestine who want a peaceful two-state solution. But they're not in the ascendancy, especially in Israel, which is the dominant military power and the occupier of the West Bank and, in effect, invading Gaza and embargoing Gaza and controlling it in so many ways. The tragedy of this problem with the media, as you have pointed out on more than one occasion, is that they start when there's violence as if the Palestinians provoke it. Everything starts with the Palestinians. And then the Israelis are retaliating. And you get right to the bottom of that. You want to describe this situation because I think over the years, 400 times more civilians have been killed by Israelis against Palestinians than Israeli civilians being killed by Palestinians. There's certainly a huge disparity. And the violence against Palestinians is ongoing and is treated by the U.S. media as kind of a non-story when that is all that is happening. The sort of day-to-day killing of Palestinians, usually unarmed, is not considered a major story. When the violence it begins to hit both sides, then it becomes a story, and often the violence against Israelis is the only story or the main focus of the story. That's what that report that you were talking about, talking about Washington Post article that where the headline, the lead, and the first several paragraphs were all about Palestinian terrorism against Israelis. And only after, I think, the sixth paragraph did the report acknowledge that there are Palestinians being killed too. And you had to really work out the math in the description to figure out that the Palestinian victims of what they call clashes with Israelis, which is stone-throwing protesters being gunned down by soldiers with automatic weapons, that was actually the, the largest group of fatalities in the violence. And they were described as the rest by the Washington Post, um, not named, not detailed, just sort of passed over as an et cetera, basically. It illustrates the power of selectivity. U.S. media have a powerful spotlight to shine on whatever events they want to highlight in the world. And you can really distort by focusing on one group of victims and leaving another group of victims in the dark. And it's not just the Washington Post. It's just a pattern. It's AP, it's the New York Times, especially the Wall Street Journal. It always starts with the Palestinians. I mean, you know, know, it's just remarkable to watch and very sad. The word retaliation is something very powerful because it creates a a sort of moral description of what's going on where you have some people provoking and some people are retaliating. And, you know, the, the violence has been going on for decades in the Middle East. So you can always start at a particular point and say, here's where you know, start the clock and, and treat anything after that as retaliation. Sometimes, Jim, when reporters are called to account on this, they say, well, you know, the Palestinians don't have much of a public relations operation and the Israeli government has a superb public relations operations. And I say to them, yeah, but you've got the great Israeli human rights group, Beth Salem, that puts out the truth right. on all of these casualties, yeah. and and they, they put it out to the Western press, but it doesn't seem to get down to the print level for readers in this Israel country. does have a very powerful PR apparatus, and in fact, there is a, a major reporter at both the Washington Post and the New York Times whose spouse is part of the Israeli public relations apparatus. I know you've called attention to these conflicts of interest at at both papers, and they have sort of dismissed it as as irrelevant. But it seems to me that if your spouse is for a living lobbying for better media coverage for a particular country, it's very difficult for you to do a, a fair job of covering that country without being influenced by your loved one's career. True enough. Let's move on to the New York Times on the Trans Pacific Partnership which you have in your headline, too secret for critics to have a right to complain about. Watch this list. Yeah, this, this is a, a, a report in the New York Times 
that was sort of sneering at critics of the Trans-Pacific Partnership as they announced the final language had been reached. Many groups from environmental groups, labor groups, groups concerned with health care, many other groups were coming out warning about this deal as a bad deal for the public. And the New York Times was saying, well, how can you criticize it when you haven't seen the deal? And the fact that you know, this is a deal that's been negotiated in secret, mainly by corporate lobbyists from various countries. For years. Um, the New York Times is, is critical of the people who have been shut out of the process for criticizing the process that they've been shut out of. And the New York Times is basically saying, you know, why don't you wait a few months or, or more to find out what's in it when it will be a done deal and there'll be no time to organize against it. And the irony is that we actually have seen quite a bit of the TPP deal as it was being negotiated because a lot of it was leaked to WikiLeaks. And, you know, the opposition by community environmental groups who got to see the chapter on the environment and were not impressed with what they saw is informed by what they had seen through WikiLeaks. But none of that made it into the New York Times account. For those of you listeners who don't know what the TPP is, it's it's basically more than a trade agreement with 12 countries like Canada, the U.S., Vietnam, Pacific Rim countries, Japan. It's been uh, completed, and President Obama sometime next year is supposed to send it to the Congress for ratification. This is an agreement that doesn't just reduce tariffs and quotas. It subordinates our health and safety in workers' standards to the supremacy of commercial trade, so that If there are food labeling requirements in California, Brazil exports food to California can say those are too onerous. You have to repeal them because they violate NAFTA or they violate the World Trade Organization. Uh, So these agreements have the force of federal law when they're approved by Congress and they have real enforcement teeth. In fact, our taxpayers were threatened with a $4 billion fine under the World Trade Organization tribunals in Geneva, Switzerland, totally secret, if we did not repeal the wildly popular congressional law that required country of origin labeling on meat products in your supermarket. So you'd know whether the meat product came from Mexico, Canada, the U.S., Japan, Brazil, Indonesia, whatever. So that's what all of these groups are objecting to, the subordination of worker, consumer, and environmental rights and improvements to these commercial tyrants that are given special privilege in these agreements. But isn't it, isn't it strange, Jim, that here is a prominent newspaper that should be up in arms about the secrecy over the years when the corporations get these drafts under the TPP and the hotel corridors that they help draft. It's okay for the corporations to get them. But you think the New York Times would be the tribune of openness. What's going on here? Why are they tolerating? Well, it's the critique that FAIR makes is that we have a a media system in this country that is overwhelmingly owned by by the wealthy, by multinational corporations, often by individuals who have deep pockets. The owner of the New York Times, the, the, the major owner of the New York Times is sometimes the richest person in the world, depending on how Microsoft stock is doing. You're talking about who there? Carlos Slim. From uh, Mexico, Mex- who's worth over $70 yeah. billion. Dollars. Yeah. And, uh, and their, their major revenue stream is not from readers, but from advertisers. That is the, the major source of their income. And so given who owns them and who funds them, it's really not surprising to us that the bent of the major media is towards defending and protecting corporate interests. It'd be surprising if, given their structure, that they would provide a platform that would be critical of the profit system and the entities that benefit from it. You know, Jim, I have to disagree with that in part because I think your comments apply to the Wall Street Journal editorial page. But, you know, I read the Times every day and they have marvelous editorials denouncing the attack on the civil justice system by insurance companies and corporations. They go after credit card fraud. They go after the pharmaceutical industry's staggering price increases. They go after BP and oil companies on their editorial page. And they do have some good op-ed there. I think in this case, When it comes to trade, it's ideological. It's Tom Friedman, the cheerleader for so-called free trade and his book, The World is Flat. 
Because I've sat with the editorial board of the New York Times uh, after NAFTA and WTO were passed. And I said to him, doesn't it bother you? You can't send your reporters to those tribunals in Geneva where decisions are made that may require us to roll back our health, safety, and worker protection laws, that these are closed courtrooms. Is that a price worth paying for what you say is loosening up free trade around the world? You know what they told me? They said, yes. In other words, here they are. They can go into every U.S. courtroom unimpeded and cover the proceedings, but they're banned from going to these tribunals under NAFTA and the World Trade Organization, and they go along with it. So I do think that it's an ideological thing. It's like they all took Economics 101 back in the 70s and 60s, uh, where they think it's still free trade instead of corporate managed trade, the global corporations. They haven't even caught up with the late Paul Samuelson, who wrote the textbook that I studied at Princeton and was a great supporter of free trade. He changed his mind before he passed away. He said... This is no longer comparative advantage. This is absolute advantage. China has modern technology, hard workers, and capital. They have all the advantages, and they pay their workers 70 or 80 cents an hour, and that's what makes it an absolute advantage, sending high-value products to the U.S. So I think it's a little bit more than you know just their advertisers. What do you there think? are certain shibboleths that you have to adhere to to be considered a, a serious thinker in Washington, and, and free trade is certainly one of them. Another is the idea that you need to reform Social Security if, you're, if you don't believe that entitlements are out of control and need to be reined in, then you don't have a seat at the adult table in Washington conversations. It's just t- sort of taken for granted that, that that's the right answer to the question. I think you're right on that. What do you think of public radio and public television? Do you ever get on any of the programs uh, of public radio and public television? It has been a very long time since we've been on. I think in some ways, public television, what we call public television and public radio in this country takes the place of truly public television and public radio. We did a couple of studies in the past year or so of the boards of the public radio and public TV stations. And it is astonishing how packed these are with corporate interests, with corporate executives, largely from the financial industry. They are the large majority on almost every board that you can find of your local PBS or NPR station. And that is because the fundraising at these institutions focuses on getting millionaires to write them big checks, and that that is what keeps the lights on there. Then they also depend very heavily on corporate underwriting, which would be called advertising if it was on a, a regular station, but they refer to it as underwriting because it's public television. And all the time, um, when, when you hear public radio, it's maddening how Almost like every four minutes or every five minutes, support comes from, and then they list it all. I remember when public radio got underway in public television, one of the arguments was it was going to be advertising free. And, and it's just maddening how many support from items are listed in any given hour. Do you know that when they air BBC programs, they're cut? They're, you're not getting the, the complete program because they have to make room for commercials, which they don't have on B- um, the BBC. And so you're seeing a cut-down version of these shows on American television so that the ads from you know, the oil company or the Archer Daniels Midland can be squeezed in. You're talking about when uh, PBS and, and NPR borrow BBC programming and right. they put them on, and they're not the whole program because they always have to interrupt and saying support for these programs comes from. Well, you know, the support from Congress is shrinking, isn't it? I think that Congress, particularly the Republicans in Congress, are very aware of, to them, the danger of truly public programming, where you have journalists who don't have to look over their shoulders at what a corporate advertiser is going to say about their report. And so they have made sure, first, that you know, if anything airs on PBS that is you know, shock the ideology of a typical Republican congressman, and that that covers a lot. It'll come up when they have their funding come up again. And they have made sure that the funding is insufficient so that you have to go to the corporations hat in hand to get a contribution from them in order to get a a program on the air. Almost every program that airs on PBS has a a corporate sponsor. It's like the Um, the news hour. 
on PBS. Yeah, that, that is willing to, to say, yeah, this is the kind of programming that our corporation will put its name up against. Isn't the taxpayer budget contribution to PBS and NPR less than 15 percent, one five? It's small, you know, and both the government and the people who, you know, who send checks in, regular people who send checks in and get a tote bag in return, they are paying for the infrastructure. They're paying for the studio and for the broadcasting tower and, mm-hmm. and, and so on. And the actual content is paid for largely by the corporations. Mm-hmm. And so they're, they're the ones who really have the say on what goes out over the air. And very more often than in the past, I think you're seeing corporations being able to give money to programming on PBS that boosts the corporation. You know, they're, they're not just, you know, polishing their image by being up against quality programming. They're actually able to get programming out that is propaganda for their product. Um, like like, one of the uh, most, like a Milton Friedman series or William F. Buckley on well, PBS. One of the most, um, one of the most outrageous examples was uh, a couple of years ago, Nova did a report on drones that was funded by Lockheed Martin, the drone manufacturer. That's amazing. They've done such good work, Nova. Uh, and, and that's yeah, a, no, it's, and it's, it's sad to see them sort of prostituting themselves by taking money from weapons manufacturers to do gee whiz programming about weaponry. And how good was the program on drones? Uh, it was, it was uh, gosh, look at this fancy new technology. They did talk about the fact that drones sometimes kill civilians, yeah. but then they promised that drone manufacturers were looking into better optical sensors that will prevent this from happening in the future. I see. One minute on C-SPAN. What's your view of C-SPAN before we close? Well, I think C-SPAN, you get an unedited view of some of what goes on in Washington through C-SPAN that you are unlikely to get on you know, CNN or certainly Fox News, and that's good. We have looked in the past at like their book show, the range of ideologies that's represented in terms of their, their book guests leaves a lot to be desired. But I still think that overall, it's you're getting a, a window into something that you wouldn't otherwise be in the dark about. Jim Narikas. Why don't you tell the listeners how they can obtain your wonderful publication, Extra, and how they can connect with you, give you leads for future stories? Sure. It's all at fair.org. You can subscribe there. You can read some of our back stuff. You can listen to our, our radio show, Counterspin. And our, our contact information is there. So, and, and we do actually depend very, very greatly on a network of supporters to, to give us tips on what's going on in the media. Jim, I have a quick question, which is more on the personal side. You were a journalist. What was it in your journalism experience that turned you in this direction to critique the media, to take this particular point of view and tell the stories from that angle? Well, you know, I started out, as you said, covering the Iran-Contra scandal. And it was a very interesting time because it was a big crack in not only the Reagan administration, but the whole ideology of U.S. foreign policy as a defender of democracy. It was really tarnished. And you could see it was a story that, that people were very excited about. And there was a pullback from it where people decided that this was no longer a story we were going to pursue very aggressively. The Reagan administration produced you know, the Tower Commission report, which was a, this was a cover-up. And people were kind of like, oh, well, that makes sense. You know, the major media outlets were very almost eager to accept a reassuring story, even if it wasn't very plausible, that left the system, you know, with its foundations intact. I always felt Contragate was like the Kennedy assassination, where the press looked into the abyss and said, oh, OK, we're not going there. Right. Isn't Contragate just scary? Yeah, no, I think that's very true. As an impressionable young reporter, it made me think that the big story was the institutions that were supposed to inform the public, and in this case, had decided not to. And that was that was really telling. Well, thank you very much for an illuminating exchange, Jim Narikas, editor of Extra, and I hope that the listeners will support this effort because if you don't watchdog the press, the press full of advertising revenues, will not watchdog big business and big government on your behalf. Thank you, Jim. Thank you, Ralph. We've been talking to Jim Narikas, editor of Extra, the monthly newsletter of media criticism from fairness and accuracy in reporting, otherwise known as FAIR. Go to FAIR.org. Ralph, can I ask you about Contragate, if you don't mind, and Arthur Lyman? Do you remember Arthur Lyman, the the attorney, the, the counsel for the Contragate Committee saying that we knew there was stuff on Reagan. 
but we didn't want to go there because he was about to negotiate a deal with Gorbachev that we didn't want to jeopardize. Oh, yeah. Uh, They could have impeached Reagan. But the argument on Capitol Hill at that time was, look, Nixon had to resign. We just can't keep filing impeachment resolutions against presidents. And he lucked out. Ronald Reagan had four leaf clovers in his pocket. He was lucky in so many ways. But they had the goods on him. This was very serious. Even the Democrats didn't want to go after him and impeach him. They just had enough with the Nixon Watergate scandal. And this was, much, was also, this was much worse. Wasn't it also just America deciding that we're an imperialist nation and that it's more important that we have the strong military than to investigate ourselves? And it, I think everything changed after Contragate. Yeah, it was like the air controller strike against labor unions. Yeah. You remember when Senator Inouye looked into the camera? He was on the committee, Senate committee investigating the Iran-Contra. He said, it looks like there's a secret government within the government. Oh, boy, he was right on the precipice on that one, huh, David? Well, that's our show. I want to thank our guest today, organic farmer Forrest Pritchard. Go to ForrestPritchard.com. And Jim Dorikas from the FAIR blog. Go to FAIR.org. For Ralph's weekly blog, go to Nader.org. Remember to visit the country's only law museum, the American Museum of Tort Law in Winstead, Connecticut. Go to TortMuseum.org. Remember, a transcript will be posted of this show on RalphNaderRadioHour.com and subscribe to us on iTunes and Stitcher. The producers of the Ralph Nader Radio Hour are Jimmy Lee Wirt and Matthew Marin. On behalf of David Feldman, I'm Steve Scrovan. We'll talk to you next week, Ralph. Thanks, Steve. Thanks, David. And listeners, mobilize. There's nothing like the grassroots sending a message to the powers that be from Wall Street to Washington. Thieves in the temple Too much money changing hands It's really very simple Just make a list of demands we demand From Pacifica, you've been listening to the Ralph Nader Radio Hour, www.nader.org Special thanks to John Richard, Matthew Marin Our graphic designer is Jimmy Lee Wirt our editor is Jimmy Lee Wirt. Our board operator is Jimmy Lee Wirt. Oh, what the hell. Let's make him our producer. Our producer is Jimmy Lee Wirt. And thanks to our executive producer, Alan Minsky. And most importantly, special thanks to Mr. Ralph Nader, www.nader.org. Our theme music, Stand Up, Rise Up, is written and performed by Kemp Harris. If you're listening to the Ralph Nader Radio Hour as a podcast and would like to listen to it as a broadcast, call your local radio station and say, I want the Ralph Nader Radio Hour. He's Steve Scrovan. I'm Steve Scrovan. He's David Feldman. Until next time. Don't let them fool you. You have the power in your hand. I'm only trying to school you. Listen to me, people. Do you understand we gotta stand up? Oh, you've been sitting way too long. Oh, step up. You know what's right and you know what's wrong. Rise up. Don't let the system hold you down. Stand up. Hey, stand up. Hey, you've been sitting up. way too long. Stand up. Oh, you should. Oh, step up. Step up. I think that you should step up. Rise up. Rise up and take on the power Stand up, stand up You've been standing way too long Stand up, stand up Step up, step up You ought to step up Rise up, rise up I know you ought to rise up Should I rise up and you rise up and you
rise up. Stand up, and you stand rise up. up. You've been sitting way too long.